Are you ready? Okay, welcome to Morgan Museum and Garden and our pandemic Zoom opening of In Nature's Realm, the art of Gerard Rutgers Hardenberg. I am Jill Berry, the executive director of Morbin, and how I wish we could all be together tonight, looking at art and sharing one another's company as we normally do at an opening. But this format is allowing for people farther afield to join us and does not care about snowy roads. We look forward to having you visit us safely in person soon. You can book your tickets in advance on our website, morvin.org. And as always, admission is free for members. Tonight's program is just a sneak peek into the show to whet your appetite for this first ever presentation of Hardenberg's work. And I think you will be delighted with this New Jerseyan's depiction of the world around him as he lived on his houseboat in Bayhead at the turn of the last century, capturing a world that would soon be lost to industry. I feel his landscapes in particular have a sense of memory about them with his soft brush strokes and beautiful colors. Fittingly enough for tonight, there is a blizzard scene and the sweetest image of rabbit in snow. From the depictions of crashing seashores and serene marshlands, works are paired with a gamesman's trove of shorebirds, hunt hunting dogs, ducks, and fish. Thoughtfully curated by our deputy director, Elizabeth Allen, with research assistance from Patricia Burke, a historian, author, and lender to the show, and Tom Van Nostrum, an avid Hardenberg collector and also a lender to the show, all of whom will be available for questions after this short presentation. This show brings forth under-recognized New Jersey talent who I've begun to think of as New Jersey's own Audubon with his attention to detail that both encouraged and furthered the knowledge of the region's fauna. I'd like to thank the following whose support made this exhibition and its related programming possible. The Hess Foundation, Fulton Bank with Sean Murray, Liza and Sky Morehouse, Lisa and Michael Ullman, Bob Wilson and Michelle Plant, and the Mercer County Cultural and Heritage Commission. We could not have done it without you. Thank you. Thank you. And on with the show. <laughs> Thank you, Jill. And on with the show. We begin on the road to New Brunswick. And we're going to learn more about this from our curator, Elizabeth Allen. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Allen. I'm the deputy director and creator here at Morvan Museum and Garden, and we are in the first gallery of our new Hardenberg exhibit. Hardenberg was born in New Brunswick in 1856, and on either side of me here, we have two of his paintings that he did of New Brunswick. We have the Raritan River here. Uh, this would be present day Rutgers University campus. Um, and then on my left over here, we have Road to New Brunswick, uh, with the steeples of St. Peter's and St. James churches. Hardenberg split his time between Bayhead, New Jersey, where he lived on the house called Pelican, and New Brunswick. Thank you, Beth. And here we see Hardenberg, as she mentioned, on the Pelican with his hunting dog, Nip. And here we have a plate from the game bird set, Woodcock, 1887, and Patricia Burke will give us a lot more information about this beautiful plate. Hello, uh, my name is Patricia Burke, and I'm the author of the book, Gerard Rutgers Hardenberg, Artist and Ornithologist. <clears throat> the exhibition is, is based on what's written in the book. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about uh, the game bird set, which was made in the 1880s. It was something that Victorians loved. They had uh, a set of plates and a platter for serving game birds. They also had um, a platter and dishes for serving ice cream. Um, they were very, very uh, 
adept at uh, using special silver utensils uh, that are no longer in use. Um, although Hardenberg and most of the exhibition focuses on his watercolors and his beautiful oil paintings of birds and landscapes of both uh, the shore town of Bayhead, New Jersey and his hometown of New Brunswick, New Jersey. Thank you, Patricia. Here we have beautiful chromolithograph of quail, 1896. And again, Patricia will give us a great more bit of information about these beautiful birds. This chromolithograph that was done in 1896. And in 1896, um, this was a new form of technology that artists were using to uh, sell to the public. It's not an oil, it's not a um, watercolor, it's a, a lithograph, but it's a colored lithograph. This is a uh, cubby of quail. There are three that he, that Hardenberg um, had produced to sell to the general public. And um, there may be more, but that, that's uh, the only ones that we have come up with. So this is a, a great example. Um, he was trying to uh, become more of a commercial artist. He um, was certainly capable of doing beautiful work. And um, this, this uh, chromolithograph is a prime example of how very talented he was. What made him think that this was going to be a popular subject that would sell? Well, he was an ornithologist and there were, uh, a lithograph would make it, uh, his work more of, uh, available financially, more affordable to the general public. Thank you, Patricia. A new form of technology, so interesting. And here we have a very unusual form of technology. He sent over 25 specimens to Princeton University and we'll find out what kind of specimens. Here is Elizabeth Allen. Well, she'll tell us about this. <laughs> One of the really fun things that we uncovered while doing research for this exhibit was the existence of a specimen shot by Hardenberg in the collection at Princeton University. Through the terrific research of Pat Burke, we knew that Hardenberg shot birds both in New Brunswick and Baghead and then would send the specimens to W.E.B. Scott at Princeton University. He was their new uh, curator of ornithology. So this label reads that Carnberg shot this Virginia rail in 1878 in New Brunswick and it made its way into the Princeton collection. Um, thanks to the help of Betty Horn over at Princeton, we know that Carnberg sent over 25 specimens between 1877 and 1880. This is the only one that's still at Princeton, um, but Betty taught us that it was common for ornithologists to trade specimens with their colleagues. So it's likely that one of those Hardenberg specimens made it to another collection somewhere in the region. Thank you, Beth. And here's an image that we've all seen quite a bit. This is a very special image to this show. Um, this is Grouse, 1885. And Tom Van Ostren will tell us more. My name is Tom Van Ostren, and I'm an avid collector of Hardenberg pennies and have been for 40 years. Actually, I've got my whole family in collecting now, so we have uh, quite an array. This uh, painting here, we chose to be the front cover of Pat Burke's book on Hardenberg because we felt it was his masterpiece. It incorporates his study of ornithology, having birds, also, birds in their natural settings. 
he'd love to use, uh, they are uh, grouse, the male, the hen, and the chick feeding on water here with the reflection in a little bit of a pond that they're sitting on. Hardenberg loved to have his birds roosting on a dead branch and then all the local floral, which would be the seagrass, the ferns, loved birch trees, and then homing all the way to the back. You can see the fern trees in the back and then tries to add a beautiful sky. Right here, you have the hen looking at a mayfly sitting on a branch that probably just hatched out of this pond. And the male and female adults do not eat bugs. They eat uh, leaves, little sticks, twigs. It's the chicks that eat the bugs. So there's the mother looking at that, wondering if that would be good feed for her chick who's in there looking for uh, any type of insect that's hatching. One of his best works, oil, front cover of the book. Thank you, Tom. We took a deep dive into that painting because it's so special. Here's another one that's very close to his heart. We know Hardenberg was an avid ornithologist and did a lot of his paintings of uh, the local birds. Here we have uh, one of his paintings of fish. He was an avid fisherman also. But this one just jumps out of me because it depicts life on the bay. You have a, a boat back here with a fisherman hooked up to a striped bass. Over here, a guy crabbing with a little crab cart pulling behind him seining on the bay, which I still do today, but which is, was very, used to catch fish and crabs back in the time. Then he hides a little crab in the seagrass down here. Just a lot going on, showing or depicting life on the bay. Thank you, Tom. We're all feeling like we're down the shore right now, aren't we? So as a perfect segue, here we are at Herbert's Creek with Bayhead Sand Dunes. We're going to see that image in 1899, right here. And then we see that beautiful image here in 1895, even earlier. And these are watercolors on paper. And Beth Allen will tell us more. One of the things that drew us to a Hardenberg exhibit was the fact that he captured New Jersey landscapes on the cusp of development. Both of these paintings show Herbert's Creek, which is now Point, in Point Pleasant, New Jersey, looking towards the ocean with the dunes of Bayhead in the distance. If you were to stand in the spot today, you'd be looking at bridges and roads and lots of buildings. Captured New Jersey landscapes on the cusp of development. That's certainly true. And here, in all its beauty, is a painting entitled Goldenrod, Loveland Town Meadow, from 1885. This is an oil on canvas, and another special one for Tom. Besides uh, Hardenberg painting all birds and fish and game, he also did a lot of landscape paintings. He spent a lot of time out in the field, in the meadows, painting sunsets, sunrises, and the beautiful different floral and trees at all different seasons. This painting here depicts one of his best pieces. I first found it collecting Hardenberg paintings. This thing hadn't been cleaned in a hundred years. So it was all dull gray. It was just another old painting. I took it to get restored and clean, and when they went to pick it up, it brought tears to my eyes to see something come to light. All this, we didn't know this was a pond in here. You couldn't see the haystacks. All of the goldenrod jumped out off the field. The sky lit up at, at sunset. And now, if you've ever been out in the marshes in Warnia Bay, 
in the evenings to actually go into the marsh. This is how it lights up. This is an exact copy of the way it was. And if you're in the right place on Barnegat that Bay now, in the evenings, this is the way it still is if you could find a place where there is no houses and no marinas. Beautiful sunset on the marshes in Barnegat Bay, turn of the century. Thank you, Tom, really beautiful. So that brings us to the close of our little highlight sneak peek look at the Hardenberg exhibition. And this is a postcard of the houseboat Pelican from a private collection. So we're gonna open the floor up now to Q&A and in the little chat box, if you would type your questions, we do have some questions that came to us earlier, but we will try to get to every question. And we can also go back to any particular painting that might have been of special interest if you note it in the chat. So thank you all so much for presentation. And we will now go oop, to Here we go. Here's everyone. Everyone's back. Okay. I'm going to spotlight. And again. There is a question while you do that. Did he live on the houseboat? And who was that question directed to? I think I think anyone. Okay, Beth, would you like to answer that one? He did live Beth. on the houseboat. Uh, Patricia, I'm right to say he lived on the houseboat until he was married. Is that right? That's correct. Yep. He married late in life. He also had a home in New Brunswick. And the funny thing is that, you know, he came from a very wealthy and educated family that came to the colony of New, New Netherland in the 1600s. Um, so people who knew the family in New Brunswick knew that, you know, his father was a lawyer. He was a real estate developer. Uh, but in Bayhead, they thought he was a bum. And he never really shared the fact that he came from this very prestigious family. Uh, the family uh, was uh, married into the Freelandhausen family, which is, you know, uh, that family is still very active in New Jersey politics. And when he did get married in his late 40s, um, he, he lived in a house that his wife had purchased in Bayhead. So they lived there in the summer and he gave up the houseboat and eventually the town of Bayhead uh, burned that boat because it was very tempting as a congregation place for teenagers. And they were afraid that, you know, um, the teenagers would start a fire. So the, the borough burned it down. Folklore has it that there were paintings that were burned on that houseboat, but I highly doubt that. I think any of his, particularly his oils um, that he spent so much time painting, uh, he would not have abandoned uh, on that houseboat, but that's folklore. That's so interesting. Um, I have a question here uh, for Beth about the bird. So that bird looked really amazingly preserved. Do you know how that could have happened? Um, we know that it was preserved with arsenic, which um, our friend Betty over at Princeton said, make sure you wash your hands after you touch, place this bird in this exhibit case, which we did. Um, but you know, by the turn of the century, they were getting better and better at taxidermy. So uh, he survives in pretty good condition. It's pretty it's a Virginia rail, by the way. 
Oh. Virginia Rail. Yeah. Oh, what did you say? I didn't even catch it. Yeah, Virginia Rail. And actually Hardenberg sent it calling it um, something different. And then Scott corrects it in the um, in the paperwork at the university. He thought it was a different type of rail when he first caught it. Um, but the paperwork shows that Scott and he then spoke and it was actually a Virginia Rail. And there is a piece of artwork with Virginia Rail, isn't there? Yes, there is in the same gallery. <laughs> So I have a question here. What rooms of the house are the exhibit? Was the Morvin once the resident of the governor? Yes, Morvin was home to five New Jersey governors. Um, and we are historic house museum that on our first floor, we explore the history of all of Morvin's residents starting in the 1750s through 1982. But then we use our second floor galleries, which would have been, of course, the bedrooms for changing exhibitions where we focus on the cultural history of New Jersey. And that's why we have this Hardenberg show up there. Thank you, Beth. Mm -hmm. um, so a question came in from Marsha Zweig. Where did he study painting? Was he self-educated? Who would like to field that question? I, I could answer. Um, he, as far as we know, he was self-educated. Um, he was one of the artists that followed right after the death of uh, Audubon, who was also um, an ornithologist and a self-educated Art. So he did exhibit, um, he exhibited at the Brooklyn Museum. He exhibited at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts in Philadelphia. Um, he did not belong to any uh, watercolor society or, um, you know, he was not a joiner in, in that sense. But as far as we know, he was self-educated and this talent, um, appeared when he was very young. So um, thank you. Uh, so Tom, we have a question for you. Uh, what made you start collecting Hardenberg? Uh, as a young boy, I used to do a lot of uh, duck hunting down Bay with a uh, gentleman, Tim Forsythe, and their family grew up in Bay Head. And um, the first time I walked into Tim's parents' house right on Bridge Avenue there, they had Hardenberg paintings, maybe a, a dozen to 20 of them on the walls. And it just blew me away. I was like, what are these? Where did they come from? Who is this artist? And uh, Tim's mom explained to me that she had taken care of, in uh, her later years, she had taken care of a woman who actually took care of Hardenberg when he got sick in his uh, last few years of his life. And Hardenberg gave her uh, a portfolio of his paintings. She had them in the attic of her house. And when she passed away, she gave Tim's mom, we all called her meme, uh, she said, you could have anything in the house you wanted. And she went up in the attic and looked around, opened up this big leather case, and there's 20 watercolors, no oils, sitting there, and she couldn't believe it. Wow. So they had them framed and put on the walls of their house. Wow. But that started my hunt right at that. I was 18 years old, and it's like, I had to find them. Back in those days, you would, you would find them in garage sales around Bayhead all the time. People would be uh, throwing them in dumpsters when they were doing house cleanouts and stuff. They were, you know, I'd find them in garage sales for like $25. You know, nobody really, and decoys at the same time, but nobody really cared about or knew about Gerard. Well, that, that leads us to another question that came in. Uh, did he receive much recognition for his art talent during his lifetime, or was he more recognized after his passing? Yeah, he he traded the artwork for everything he wanted groceries repair work uh the a apple gates have a uh, half dozen paintings in the show uh, bob at uh, his house has probably a dozen to 20 paintings and they came from his grandfather wyckoff applegate who's one of the uh, founding partners of town and was the local uh, builder but he uh, Bob said his grandfather told him that he used to do repair work on Hardenberg's houseboat all the time. 
and Hornberg would give him a painting. He said he never bought one from him. He said it was all on it bartered. Wow, really interesting. So that, that leads us here. So was he able to make a living selling his paintings or did he rely on his family's and his wife's means? Well, I know he had um, exhibitions right before the holidays, generally in the month of November, in a gallery in New Brunswick. So he did sell some of his paintings. Um, how much, um, I don't know. In the newspapers, New Brunswick newspapers in the 1880s, 1890s, um, he got fantastic reviews of his work and um, would hold them, you know, annually, these uh, sellings right before the, the Christmas holidays. But um, he was a man who uh, had very simple needs and um, only <laughs> much later in life, his, um, he, he married his wife, he was in his late forties and she was a wealthy woman from uh, Stratford, Connecticut. And um, so that eased some of um, you know, his financial problems. I think that Pat made the great point though in her, um, when she was speaking in the video about the fact that he was able to get you know, his designs on plates being manufactured in France is he must have had some business savvy to be supporting himself between that and the lithograph. And there's a fantastic game that we didn't show that you have to go see in the first gallery. It's called Hardenberg's Playmates that um, Patricia and Tom have taught me about. And there's only one known copy, right, Tom? And this is it. Yes. And, and, um, eBay. and it's amazing. And it's a it's his his artwork made into a game where you can place birds in their habitat. So he was definitely thinking about ways to make money. Well, thank you guys. Um, now, of course, somebody's going to ask this question. What are they worth today with all these uh, question marks? What are they worth today, folks? Well, like any artwork, they're worth what someone's willing to pay. <laughs> That's a market, good answer, Tom. <laughs> great answer. market is that always, everyone always says, what's that worth? Well, whatever someone wants to pay for it. Uh, about three years ago, one of his oil paintings sold actually in a decoy auction down in South Carolina, and it was an oil painting, large format. I think it had 20 to 22 quail in it, four feet wide, maybe about three feet high. So it was a large format painting, and it sold for around $45,000. And we now, tried to find that painting for the show, but we didn't get lucky on that. Yeah. Wow. So, so yeah, you know, it's the oils obviously you're going to trade for a little higher than the watercolors, but people still, he's not recognized by, uh, you know, because there's so few people that have them and everybody has them, uh, holds on to them. And when I found with someone buys one of his paintings, they're always like, okay, where can I get another? Once it hangs on their walls and they look at it from time to time or they have, uh, dinner guests over and they start telling the story of Hardenberg that he grew right up in Bayhead and you know, it's an interesting uh, conversation piece but also so beautiful at the same time. Well now you mentioned Tom that you got your whole family involved in collecting so how many collectors are Vinostrans? Well it's just uh, my wife Lisa and our and the kids so everybody's always out looking <laughs> and we found them in California. We found them in Florida, Arizona. A lot, a lot of wealthy people worked their way through Bayhead in life and would end up retiring in uh, Florida or Arizona, California. And uh, we actually, those last series of plates I found came from uh, just outside of Paris in France, you know, so they are everywhere. Wow. Wow, so our next note here is just wanted to say hello, Patricia, my company Fishergate designed her book and we spent much time enjoying yeah. his paintings and plates. So great to see more exposure for this artist and learn more about him. Thank you for the exhibition, so thank you. Um, the next question, why did Hardenberg contribute his specimens to Princeton instead of Rutgers in his hometown? 
Ooh, question for well, you, I Matt. think I can answer that. Yeah, yeah. Um, Princeton was only one of four colleges at the time in the United States that taught a course in ornithology. It was a new science just beginning to be developed. And I don't think a Rutgers uh, had a biology department where ornithology was taught. That's interesting. Do they still- and I know that their museum had just opened. The biology museum was fairly new when um, Hardenberg's contact Scott started at Princeton. He was the new curator of ornithology. So Pat, I'm sure Pat's right. There wasn't a counterpart at Rutgers yet. Um, so that brings us to this interesting question. Did Hardenberg ever contribute to any field or bird guides? And you know, he did. Um, and I think that's why he is not well known. Um, in the 19th century, uh, you needed to have a patron to support the publication of a field guide. And um, Boston had a, 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 a patron for the artist Cope, but he um, did not have a patron. And I'm not sure if Hardenberg had planned, had any idea of planning to publish something, if he could get someone to financially back him. But we do know that in his obituary, it mentions that he had published an or, or, uh, a bird chart that was by the American Ornith Ornithological Union. No one has found that chart to date. It's out there somewhere. Well, so then there's the hunt is still on, right? The hunt is still on for that. Um, yes, and that that publisher was Scribner's. I don't know if I mentioned that, but um, the book publisher Scribner's published that chart. Um, so, uh, so he was so. Next question. So he was prolific. How many oil paintings do you think he painted? I didn't hear the question. How many oil paintings do you think he painted? Oh, he painted every day of his life. So how many survived? I have no idea. I, no, I know of maybe 50 or so, you know. Uh, our family probably has around 20. And so they're out there. Did, obviously, he did a lot more watercolors because he spent a lot of time out in the field, loved sunrise, sunset. Um, so I have another question that just came in. So since you're the, on the big hunt for these things, is there a particular piece that you're hunting for that you have not found, the Holy Grail? Is there a piece that you just can't wait to find? Well, I would love to find uh, all those chromolithographs he did. There had to be an original of that <laughs> so, out there. So obviously uh, those originals are somewhere in someone's attic somewhere, you know, because uh, they never popped up. I've never seen them, never popped up. And after uh, 40 years of collecting, you'd think you'd I'd find one of them. I was hunting forever for one of the original plates you know, obviously he sent those plates, those paintings to um, to France. And um, I don't know, after they did the plates, they probably destroyed the paintings because they didn't want any more copies of them. So the next question, are they ever on eBay? Well, are they ever on eBay? Hmm? They I'm are not going to want you looking. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're on eBay. They obviously uh, years ago there were uh, a lot more often you would find them there, but uh, they do pop up once in a while. I mean, in the last six months, I've probably found uh, three or four of his paintings. 
most recently at an estate sale out in Long Island that I found uh, on the internet, but they were buried on page, maybe uh, when you're doing on the search engine, they were maybe buried on page nine or 10, somewhere way in the back. And it, they didn't come into any auction. It was just someone's private estate auction, a doctor who passed away on Long Island. And he was an avid hunter and fisherman and he had two uh, Hardenberg uh, oil paintings. And part of the deal was you bought it and then you had to drive up the next day to pick them up because they weren't doing any delivery. So it was probably a two and a half hour drive out into Long Island each way you know, to go get them. So, so the questions are coming in hot and heavy here. And now. Okay, which piece of art would you say is his magnum opus, his most important piece of work for which he is most recognized? Well, the front cover, that, that uh, the painting of the grouse. I mean, he was, I think he was most, obviously he's most known for his birds and his study of ornithology. And that one just jumps out because it has so much going on in it. And, I would agree. I would agree with Tom. And to, uh, to have lasted this long, you know. I never had that one clean. There were, uh, a few of them we had, uh, clean and and redone and and um, restretched and but that one that's exactly the way I found it. it was well taken care of. So another question here: How many? How many do you have now? <laughs> a lot. I don't know how many. You know, I have a lot of them in closets. I have. Uh, portfolios of them where they're uh, not in frames. So I would say over a hundred paintings, but once we started putting uh, the collection together for this show, I realized I had a lot more than I thought. <laughs> I always thought someday, you know, uh, when I was retired that maybe we'd have a little gallery in Bayhead, not just for uh, Hardenberg, but you know, uh, I didn't Clara Stroud and uh, Edward Bolton, other uh, local paintings from the head of the bay, painters from the head of the bay, and also decoys. But that uh, it never panned out. I decided not to sell anything. We enjoy them too much. <laughs> but now I'm glad that they're out of the house and other people can come and look at them. And hopefully we'll have a lot of people stop by the museum once things uh, ease up a little bit with the pandemic. Because they are special, they are beautiful. The uh, landscapes are uh, a moment in time all around the bay from La Valette, Matalokan, Bayhead. A lot of them are from the on Manasquan River from Brielle and uh, Point Pleasant, West, West Point Pleasant. So he traveled around the shore a lot. He had a canoe that he went on uh, up and down the bay, uh, Beaver Dam Creek, Matita Conk River. He, you know, he didn't stay uh, close to home. Now, when I mentioned to you um, about his comparison to Audubon, what did you say as comparing Hardenberg to Audubon? I've been to uh, a couple of Audubon exhibits and his work is incredibly detailed. You know, he's, he paints the birds scientifically and exactly the way uh, that he saw them, but he, he spent his life traveling the world and didn't spend a long, any long period of time in any one spot. Hardenberg spent 30 years in the head of the bay and not only painting the birds, but hunting. So he had all like that Virginia rail. I'm sure he kept a uh, species uh, in the snowbank outside his, uh, his houseboat, you know, to get everything uh, detailed right, but also being a hunter myself, looking at his paintings, he just catches the birds right with the way they turn their heads and when they're sticking out their chest and uh, male and female together. And you know, he, his more was, uh, I think his were more truer to life in the field. Another good reason to come see the exhibition because if you've heard of Audubon, but you haven't heard of Hardenberg, you can come make a comparison for yourself. And we are, I mean, this is our opening, right? So 
even with the pandemic, we are open and uh, we're open safely and um, beautifully. And it is, you know, tomorrow we open at noon. So um, yeah, you can come visit and, and see the exhibition. And we're gonna be having, uh, you know, walks with Pat and Tom as the time goes on, cause it'll be up for about